So what I try to do is not uh, line by line exegesis of what Ms. Cruz has said, but I will add here and there to what she has said and also provide a wider context to see where, where and how we're dealing with the topic of what we call open digital science. Professor Tochterman already referred to the, you know, to the debate. I, I wouldn't really say, say it's, a, it's an argument, but it's a, certainly a debate about what the right uh, terminology is. I don't find that very fruitful. So, I mean, this is the term that our commissioner liked best. And uh, as you pointed out, digital comes from the digital agenda. Open, we are across a lot of policy areas, and so this seemed like a, like a perfect fit. But we are, of course, discussing with our colleagues as well who deal uh, with this under different names. So, first of all, uh, in keeping with good practices of uh, open digital science, this presentation is already online, so maybe you cannot uh, verify everything that's in it, but at least you can have another look uh, and maybe go from there to, to the sources, uh, as it were, uh, of what I'm going to tell you. I also should well, here you find me. Uh, if you Google me or go to Twitter or to, to my page at the European Commission, there's also my email address and phone number there in case you want to send a message. I can only invite you to be in contact if there are, if there are any issues. We try to be very uncomplicated and non-bureaucratic in responding to that uh, quickly. So it, it's not a, not a black hole in, into which uh, any of your messages would, would vanish over there. I should also uh, stress that I'm speaking in a personal capacity. I have to do that. Uh, the only people who don't speak in a personal capacity for the Commission are official spokesmen, and they normally don't go to conferences, uh, or President Barroso himself, uh, who also doesn't go to so many uh, conferences. So you only hear me speaking, but you can, can be very sure that lots of what I'm telling you, actually, I would claim everything is covered by uh, official policy of our institution. Um, why is the Commission interested in this whole uh, exercise? Uh, you, previous speaker already referred to various initiatives, specifically in Germany, but of course it's an international uh, endeavor, and uh, the Commission as a policymaker is, of course, very interested in seeing uh, those developments. We also, as was mentioned already, fund a lot of research, so it's a very practical question for us as a funder too, uh, how to deal with those things. And we are also building infrastructures, and uh, as Nelly just pointed out, infrastructure is an important element uh, of, uh, of this whole equation, not just because people use services that other people have built for other purposes and then make them their own for their own purposes, but also uh, because there are more specific infrastructure uh, needs and requirements that we try to fulfill uh, at the European level by, in most instances, federating what's happening at national level so that really uh, researchers and research as such don't, uh, doesn't have to stop at borders uh, anymore. Uh, there's a complicated uh, institutional uh, setting, of course, in the European Union every time it comes to legally binding uh, instruments. Uh, Nearly mentioned open access requirements in Horizon 2020. This is actually a law uh, by now, and it uh, took a long time to become a law because these two stern-looking institutions here uh, had their say on it for, for, for almost two years. Uh, they were debating about this. And obviously the member states themselves as such, so not as part of the council, but each one uh, on their own also play a role in this because they have their own research funding, which by the way is 90% of public research funding in Europe. 90% member states, 10% EU uh, just looks like a big bucket because it's one bucket, but it's, it's actually the smallest part. And what we try to do is really to do to support those initiatives, especially in the infrastructure area, that connect what goes on elsewhere and try to push others to use their funds and their opportunities to go into the right directions too. To give the whole thing a face, uh, I'll be uh, a, a gray face. Uh, this is the commission. <laughs> it's a bit smaller uh, than it is now because they're just 27 uh, if you manage to count this fast. Uh, but the two important ones uh, are this one, uh, who's the Science Commissioner, Ms. Gagan Quinn from Ireland, uh, whose uh, main product in the, in the uh, commission that's ongoing was something we call the flagship initiative on innovation union. This is basically the innovation research uh, policy uh, framework document out of which then Horizon 2020 grew as a proposal and then as a legislative uh, um, uh, debate and now as a law. Uh, and back then, that was in 2010, uh, she already and her people in the Innovation Union had to say uh, these things about open access specifically, which was kind of the focal uh, aspect that, that was very prominent at the debate, uh, in the debates at the time, but of course it is, in a, in a way, it's just the, the entrance for the whole open science uh, discussion because many of these things you don't need to put in the law. It's simply that uh, you know, by doing uh, things and by supporting the right things as a funder, you have an impact on how, how it develops. Um, then, Anel, you just saw her. She's the commissioner for digital stuff, and that's a lot. It's not just research. There's also the whole telecommunication side of it, telecommunications market, telecom regulation. You know, we liberated the telecom 
market, but that means that there is now quite hard uh, regulation. We have agencies in every country dealing with this. We have the commission who, uh, who has an oversight role. Uh, that is her, her remit too. She's also dealing with internet uh, governance, uh, so complicated question about who, who actually controls the internet, what are the future uh, developments there, how does it relate to science, uh, international uh, relations in, in digital stuff, uh, and so on. Uh, in the digital agenda, also 2010, we already uh, also referred to open access, and then that was really a process and starting 2010, going to the first green paper on Horizon 2020 on what would become the new framework program to the proposal and through the whole time this was one of the st strands that Nelly personally was very supportive of. Uh, if, you, if you look a bit into the archives you see herself uh, addressing the issue on various occasions in, in no unclear terms. So uh, on that basis we have always felt that, that this is a topic that, that needs further pushing uh, and there's also ripe to do more uh, at the European level. The Commission is, uh, is a body that is prone often to, to, to wait a bit and see what, what other people are doing and try to take a position squarely in the middle. We call this the balanced position. I'm very much in favor of that in, in most instances, but sometimes I feel this can be slow. And it, especially in digital uh, matters, we see that developments are so fast that if you wait too long for something to emerge, you will always run behind. And uh, Nelly has very much uh, shared this, this view, and that's why she has decided to, to, to take a step ahead and tr actually try to lead uh, development, and certainly in the Commission, that's what she did. Um, I don't want to give you a whole overview of the whole digital agenda. It's quite large, but uh, suffice it to say that there is uh, one pillar in it, uh, which is about R&D. So research innovation, uh, especially in ICT. So we have found, like everybody finds who looks at this, that's a, that there is not enough of it in Europe, especially if compared to other parts of the world. Uh, that's a fairly uh, factual statement uh, that we have made there. So we wanted to change that. Uh, for you to judge whether, whether we were successful, uh, I can, I can uh, tell you that uh, investments in Europe in agriculture and uh, uh, these kind of things are still four times as high as in innovation and technology across all scientific disciplines. Uh, it will not surprise you that our commissioner wasn't the biggest fan of this kind of split. Uh, this is simply the outcome of the fact that you have a political body that has to deal with a whole breadth of political issues. And uh, you know, it's, it's not very easy to go uh, to, to one constituency and tell them that their money is now gone. And so it's all you know, stepwise. We have seven-year programs, not five-year, seven-year programs. And uh, it takes time uh, to change things. We have come to a real increase on research. We have come to a nominal decrease even on, on agriculture. So direction is right, but it will take until, I don't know, 2080 to, <laughs> to, for the two to, to change position, uh, which is obviously too long. Uh, what we have um, concentrated on, uh, apart from the money itself is of course also the substance and uh, ICT I mentioned it but also the infrastructure specifically so we really laid, put a big emphasis on making sure that there's enough money available to build the digital infrastructures that we need uh, for the future uh, to support uh, open digital science uh, starting from a general uh, perspective of pooling of resources we want the member state resources to go into the same direction as the European resources we use the European resources to make them go into this direction if we are successful and we are in some areas, so that was really the plan, 2010. And obviously all what I'm going to tell you now about the digital science policy, uh, you can find in Nutsche already in that uh, document. Now, Horizon 2020 it was mentioned for those who, for whom this is not their, their daily bread. Just a quick run through, uh, we have a new structure, there are three pillars. One is called scientific excellence. There you have the European Research Council. Many of you will be uh, familiar with that. We have also a lot of uh, ICT components in there, specifically all the research infrastructures, including e-infrastructures. We have high performance computing, the high performance computing initiative. Um, uh, we have future and emerging technologies, which is also a very uh, ICT prone topic because some of you may have seen the, the Human Brain Project uh, as one of the flagships that we fund there. And this is, of course, a very, very computer heavy uh, exercise. Competitiveness, that's basically all the, the from the IT, ICT perspective, all the geeky stuff, uh, robotics, uh, chips all of those things uh, that, that need to be there where, where European industry either exists or still exists or, or wants to exist in the future. There's also space research there and really the, the stuff that you can touch. Uh, and then on societal challenges, um, this is the ma major novelty in terms of structure for Horizon 2020. We try to uh, address the question uh, along their societal 
important. So you go and say, well, health is an issue, climate is an issue, what, what do we do about it? So it's applied research, but a very strong, with a very strong focus for horizontal connections. So it's really, the, the aim is not to spend into all directions, but to make sure that this, the investments that we do in hardware, for example, or in the infrastructure, uh, indeed, uh, contribute to, this, uh, to, the, to the solving of uh, the societal challenge issues. It's, it's one third, more or less, for each of these pillars. ICT is uh, about 20 million of overall. 80 billion euros, that's the size of this program. It has been finally agreed last December and the first calls have been published. They are online as we speak. Uh, the first deadlines are in April, so if anybody of you feels motivated to take a shot at that, uh, it is still possible. Some of these deadlines are also longer uh, until the mid end of the year in September. I think uh, there are many uh, deadlines in September. So there's still an opportunity to have a look uh, at, at what we try to do. Very important, maybe for some of you, uh, the major, not structural, but, but let's say instrument-related novelty of Horizon 2020 is the fact that it also supports innovation. Uh, Naley mentioned it a few times too. This wasn't the case in FP7. And what it means is that not every project really has to develop something new. It can also concentrate on pushing out the stuff that we have already developed in the past or that's already there and that's quite relevant because uh, you don't know of course all the settings that you are coming from but in many settings there's a lot of conservatism structurally uh, in place and it's not the fact that some new technology is actually available uh, that directly makes it happen. Uh, in, in hospitals you don't have the new stuff, uh, newest technology directly there. There are lots of players and there are lots of decision making that taking place and it can take a long time. And so. What we have uh, with Horizon 2020 is a chance to address this uh, also with European funding to bring the players together and to make them invest. Okay, this was kind of a general introduction. Now, more specifically, open digital science. Uh, with hindsight, I have taken to call this uh, package that we adopted in July 2012 the open science package. It has three parts. One of them was explaining what we're going to do for open science. So it's basically about data and information uh, and its availability. So it explained the, the future open access policies uh, that the Commission intended to take. So it basically explained Horizon 2020, what, what we wanted to do in there. The recommendation takes this up and it uh, recommends officially to member states to think about those issues, to get uh, policies in place for data as well. It's also about archiving, preservation, uh, access, and so on. And the third part, the European research area, that is a policy area of, of the treaty, so it's a goal of the European Union to create a European research area. Um, at this time, the Commission has not decided to make this a legal uh, instrument, like a directive or regulation, uh, but they have taken a more voluntarist uh, approach with uh, partnering with uh, science organizations, Science Europe and a number of others, who, who speak for their partners and their members, uh, and have uh, taken on certain commitments. One of them is also open access, but it's also about exchange of research researchers and so on. And we have a chapter in there which is called the digital era. And this is really about providing the tools and the infrastructures that allow the researchers to not only move physically to another place and to be working there with their partners in another country, but also doing it virtually from their own home station to provide the tools and opportunities uh, to really do that. Uh, this happened in a broad, amid a broad discussion of stakeholders. Our commissioner was in, in Rome in April the same year where, where the ALEA uh, organization, so all the European Academies of Science uh, uh, and Humanities, uh, presented her with a, their paper on open science, uh, which of course we read very attentively. Uh, there's another one quite famous, uh, the paper from the Royal Society uh, in, in the UK, Science as an Open Enterprise, also a, a major um, uh, say inspiration for what we uh, formulated uh, as a policy after all. So this is kind of the, the major setting. Then there's also a wider digital policy context, which stems from the digital agenda and, and other uh, developments. I just very quickly run through so that you see the kind of world that we are sitting in when trying to push forward uh, the, the digital science agenda. So there is uh, something called the data protection reform. I think especially in Germany, it's difficult to not know about this because the newspapers and, and the media are quite, uh, quite uh, regularly reporting about this. It is also an important initiative. Our commissioner was one of two commissioners who proposed this reform, and of course, the major challenge there is to deal with data and privacy in the 21st century in a world that has an internet, that has ubiquitous connectivity, that has people running around with sensors in their pockets. Uh, this has been tabled 2012. It's still being debated because member states don't want the same thing as parliamentarians and there's a classical political fight going on. We have a high performance computing strategy. There are the main goals in two sentences. One, stimulate 
uh, know-how and uh, capacity in Europe to provide this kind of technology to stimulate the uptake and use of this technology by researchers, but also uh, of the wider community, SMEs, industry, and so on. Uh, we are also pooling resources there, member states putting together their money to build uh, and to acquire top uh, tier zero machines, so in the top 10 of the, of the rankings of high performance computing in the world every one or two years. Uh, we're speaking hundreds of millions of euros here, so it's not an easy, not an, not an easy one that many EU member states could do on their own so that a partnering approach is quite important. Cloud computing, this is again an industrial strategy. What we try to get there is to have a faster adoption of this new technology inside all companies in the, in, um, in the economy who use IT, simply with the argument in mind that this will mean a productivity gain, and if they don't gain this productivity but their competitors in other parts of the world do, it means a net uh, loss for them, so a loss in, connect, uh, in, in competitiveness. This is the main goal of this. Obviously, it's also relevant for science because we are talking about a technical trend here, and this technical trend doesn't stop at, at business doors. Uh, in fact, we are funding a project of a very large science organization, EMBL is in there, CERN is in there, European Space Agency, who have their own data needs, who create lots of data on, on a daily basis, and they need to deal with this. They have built systems in the past, uh, set up or based on public sector in, uh, infrastructure, the European Grid Initiative, for, for some of you who have been active in this field, uh, may, may come to mind. But these companies and uh, organizations have realized that they cannot do uh, cannot achieve the agility and flexibility needed for those infrastructures only from public in, uh, investment because it means some university or some institute somewhere building, building a huge machine for them to, to keep pushing the bits uh, towards that machine and that's not always evident and automatically happening, especially not in time of a financial crisis. And that's why this cloud computing strategy is a relevant one because our partners organizations in the science area also going uh, to that side. We're trying to build a single market for telecoms in Europe. It's quite amazing today. You can travel to most countries in the EU without ever stopping or showing your passport or doing any of those classical border-related things. Uh, but you cannot do many things uh, online uh, in this way because the rules are different. Especially you cannot provide uh, telecom services across borders. Today we have a really fragmented market and our commissioner has uh, packaged, uh, tabled a package last year uh, to address that, which is also relevant because if you talk data and we talk access to data, use of data, analysis of data across borders. We are not only talking about making copies and sending them to all kinds of places, we are also talking about you accessing data which is elsewhere, dealing with this data. So it's about transmission of data access uh, across borders. We had the European Council, for those that don't know, that's the, the grouping of European heads of state and government uh, who meet twice a year, twice, three times a year more or less, uh, meeting in October last year and they have uh, quite explicit language about the potential of uh, cloud uh, technologies, big data, and others. Uh, we have decided, our commission has decided to go back to the council and explain what we are already doing to address this issue. Many of the things that I'm telling you now are, are part of this overall picture, but there will be some others. So we are actually working on an initiative there for the next half year. And there's something we call the digital single market, which is a wider package of elements that we try to address uh, uh, in the future. And there are things in there, for example, tax regimes that are different for online, offline goods in various countries. People don't know when they buy uh, music online or video, for example, whether they can actually watch it in the place that they are living uh, so that they can access it, but it's, it's unclear what happens if they themselves then with this video in their pocket cross a border. All these questions are there and they hold back the development of this market. So this is the wider uh, policy context. Now, Open Digital Science in the Commission, Mr. Tochterman already mentioned there is a public consultation in, in preparation and uh, actually this is quite a new development because in the meantime, uh, uh, briefly, uh, sound were, sounds were that there would be no public consultation. Um, right now we are again preparing something and what I'm trying to give you on the next few slides before ending this talk is a little bit of an overview. Of course, it's speculation because we're talking about the future, uh, about what is going to be uh, covered in there. So what is the, the, the say, the, uh, our, our perspective? What are we looking at uh, explicitly um, when we want to address open digital science as a matter of policy? And of course, this is about better tools. Infrastructure, I mentioned it variously already, is about better data and more data. That's where the whole open access uh, policy comes into play. Of course, related to infrastructures because uh, we can only do open access because we have networks, we have repositories, we have the technology for people to actually access it afterwards. Uh, there's also something called open da uh, data, which is relevant here. So this is data which can also become the subject of scientific work. So you can analyze this data, you can do things with this data, but the data itself doesn't stem from 
scientific activity because it stems from the public sector activity. We're talking about geospatial data here, for example, we're talking about finance data, uh, transport information, all of these things that the public sector in the course of its work generates, but which themselves are a treasure trove of information that uh, also will become relevant uh, for uh, the work of the scientists. We look for better uses of data. Uh, you already mentioned uh, the, uh, the problem, or the problem, the, the challenge of evaluating uh, research um, activity in the 21st century. Ms. Cruz also mentioned a few items there. So this is a, let's say, a field that, that we look at. There the question is mainly what are the main levers that we can use to, to, you know, to go in the right direction, to make progress. And then bringing, in a way, all of these things together, and I liked it also in your talk, the, the citizen science, of course, a very relevant thing, and not only for all the reasons that you mentioned and that I think stem or are visible from, from this overview here, but also because politically, this is what, what counts nowadays, and we are discussing uh, huge amounts of uh, money that go to various countries in Europe to save banks, for example. Uh, there's a lot of debate going on there, and the, the arguments are not always, uh, let's say, bought by everyone or felt to be convincing, and with science, it's a, it's a bit the same, especially as we have seen in the crisis, some countries have actually cut their expenditure in this area, and so you need to, you need to justify if you spend money uh, on these fields. And uh, citizen science, I think, is one positive avenue identified to, to go there and make this real, not just you know, a speech, but really provide the opportunities for more people to become involved. So I know that uh, the time is, is uh, advanced, so I try to be quick. Uh, these are quite, um, uh, let's say, uh, well, they are ripe reports because they are two or three years old already. Uh, I recommend to everyone who hasn't seen them to take a look at that because they, both of them are the blueprints of what we do in e-infrastructures uh, for the future. If you look into that, you will see what we imagine to be the data infrastructure of the future. So we, are, we, we don't say Facebook or others, they will kind of deal with those issues. They, we, we just wait for the general purpose platforms to become good enough. We also go from it to it from the other side. We think about what, can, what, what would we need if we could really freely choose the tools and instruments that we have. That's the starting point. You see uh, the, the Riding the Wave report had 2030 as its uh, focus of, uh, of consideration. And then backtracking from that, we, we derive what we need to do today in order to, to be arriving there in 2030. Um, this is a complicated slide. What you should get, get from that is only our view of the world in the sense that uh, there are layers of, of important things that are happening. We're looking at uh, the services, uh, high performance computing, I mentioned open access infrastructure, the data infrastructure is kind of underlying enabling um, infrastructure. And then on the top of that, you have the researchers that actually work in this area that need to assemble their own workspaces. That's what uh, VRE stands for, virtual research environment. Um, where they pull together the resources that they need, and these resources may, may reside in different countries, different parts of the world, they may include partners from all over the place, and what we try to do is to build the infrastructure that allows this to happen. And obviously, existing general purpose social media and other exchange platforms, they play a role too, because this, these are tools that allow you to be in contact very quickly without installing anything else, so it's, it's very convenient. But of course, in, if you look at the, at the structure of it going forward and the, uh, the stability, uh, you need more, uh, more planning for that. Quickly to this, who's interested, uh, those who are interested can have a look at these slides online and have a look at these uh, uh, projects. I especially recommend to have a look at UDAT uh, down here. Uh, this is a European project to build a European data infrastructure. Lots of partners in there, including Germany. Uh, partners uh, between the, the communication and, and the data centers of universities and research centers, but also of the research centers that actually create the data, so the, the domain experts partnering in this and trying to come up with a general purpose, but still, um, let's say, sophisticated enough approach to data that allows afterwards people from different disciplines to use this infrastructure in a quite common way without losing the specificity of their uh, various areas. Oh, so you have linguists in here, you have physicists, you have all kinds of different uh, disciplines covered. Uh, I don't go through this. Have a look. This is the currently open call uh, for pro uh, proposals. And you see here, especially in the, in the e-infrastructures part, um, lots of things here which are related uh, to data, data processing here, research data, virtual infrastructures, the high performance computing, open access infrastructure, many interesting things uh, that directly relate to uh, open digital science. Um, 
here I can jump over because we have another talk uh, tomorrow. You already mentioned that, uh, where you get much more detail. Um, I would only just say that, uh, again, here our commissioner decided to set very ambitious goals. Uh, I think we are in a good way uh, to reach those goals. And, um, you know, it was a lot of work in the last few years, but now it is, it is about implementation. So now it's about everyone who is in a European project. They will, will be explained by some what the rules are. And we hope, of course, that those rules will make a difference in, in uh, behavior. And it's not just about requirements, it's also about incentives, obviously. So this I leave for, uh, for my colleague uh, for tomorrow. Open data, um, yeah, well, here you see a word cloud. Why open data is important also as a political topic. It's about transparency, it's about fairness, it's about taxpayer-generated data. It all belongs to us already, but it's sitting over there in the public administrations, and they, first of all, they don't know what it is. Secondly, they don't really like to share it because they're afraid that we may then ask questions. Uh, and certainly, there are also things in there which could be very useful for not just science and, and society, but also for the economy. Uh, so it's a very basic argument here that we are, that we are running, uh, but it's a, quite a clear principle that uh, we set out a number of years ago, just along alongside the open access policies. So there we have legislation in place, the Public Sector Reuse Directive, um, which complements member states' act activities and, and initiatives. We also push out EU data, so if there's stuff in the Commission that you think uh, should be online and you don't have it, uh, just ask for it, because we have a policy that basically says the answer needs, the answer needs to be yes. Uh, I would personally want to see all this data automatically being pushed online uh, proactively, but uh, you know, everybody who has worked in the public sector institution knows that those things are not always uh, happening on their own, so one has to push from both sides, from inside and outside, so I can only uh, um, recommend that you take a look at, at our open data portal, and we're building one for the whole European Union, by the way, where the member state activities in these fields are, ag are aggregated, so later on researchers will have a chance, for example, to look at spending data or transport movements across the whole Union. Um, from, from a very uh, granular perspective by looking at member, member states' data. Altmetrics. So here I'm really in, in, in an area for speculation because I, you know, I cannot foresee what will come out of this policy work that we are going to do. But certainly there is the question uh, about measuring the use and impact of uh, publications. There's the question what this would mean for journals. Will we see no journals in the future or a new type of journal? Um, uh, how does it relate to the evaluating, uh, evaluation of researchers? Because there, of course, the publication is one element, but there are many others. You already mentioned it. We, for example, are very keen on data publications, so that people that publish their data, because it implies curation of the data and you know, uh, clean metadata, useful metadata, that there's also a re reward uh, linked to that, uh, so that uh, scientists, not after publishing an article, then, then just let, you know, let it fall down, go to the next article, and all the, the good stuff that uh, is in there is then lost because other people cannot build on it. By the way, it's of course also relevant for replicating research and for, for uh, honesty in research. Uh, there have been recent cases, of course, where it would have been quite relevant to know uh, the data underlying publications uh, for checking. And then there's also something you already mentioned, electronic publishing, new models for publishing. Uh, you know, in the wake of all these open access policies, of course, members, uh, um, uh, publishers come to us and, and are wondering what the future will look like, what, what we're going to do there. There are people that have new models of how to do open access publishing in a way that allows them to keep doing their business, but allows us to reach the open access goals and in the, in the middle make it easy for the researcher. They come and want information and want to work together, so there will be an activity there. And data publications I already mentioned. Final point, citizen science. Um, this is really a huge field, and I'm not sure that any initiative this year or next year will, will exhaust it. Uh, but of course, it's a start uh, to go there. It is about the influencing the goals. So if you have a buy-in as to what the money is spent for, you're, you're tied more to the outcomes than if somebody else decides. It's always easier to criticize if you have not been in the boat yourself. And this is really a long-term issue because science, you know, as, as we do today, it, it often still works to, you know, to, to play the card of the expert but it will not work uh, forever. We've seen it in other areas, so it's important to prepare for that. Uh, today, we also, every one of us, uh, collecting data, whether we know it or not. Uh, we all have smartphones in our pockets, so we are, we are basically sensors. The only question is whether this data is actually shared with our knowledge, against our knowledge, against our will. Uh, there uh, will a lot of work have to be done to, to make that, you know, to, to create the trust in this area, but if that's 
successful. I think there's a lot of potential in there. Um, we also know already these uh, applicants, uh, appliances and applications of what I call crowd science. So many eyeballs looking at the same thing, you know, finding craters on the moon uh, or you know, finding extraterrestrials in, in the radio data. There, there are examples of that already in the past. I think we will see more of that. And then there are things like the quantified stuff where people actually add more sensors to themselves. Uh, recently, for the for the Germans uh, among you, you may have seen there was a debate in the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung because Mr. Schirmacher, the editor, uh, did take uh, an ob objected against our commissioner having an armband that measures her steps every day. Well, she you saw her; she's 72 years old, so she needs to do something for her health, as we all have to, I think. And so he, he was very critical of her doing this, but I think this is completely the wrong view because what this makes, uh, it, it uh, replaces lots of costs that would come later, lots of costs associated with, with using and visiting doctors. It can make yourself, uh, empower yourself to help yourself in, in many interesting ways. And we think this is a very important development. Of course, again, it needs a frame. And final point from me, because I'm also working right now at the big data uh, initiative that I mentioned earlier political initiative in the era of big data. Um, big data is actually quite relevant for scientists because what it means is that science is taking over the business. Uh, everybody will be scientists, we are all empiricists, and the, the business model of Google is basically one of experimentation. They just experiment the whole time, and that's how they do their money. They optimize, experiment. Uh, this used to be the domain for, for scientists, and uh, if you came to the business world, it was a bit more you know, rule-based and rules of thumb and so on. This is changing, it's very relevant. I think it's a huge chance for scientists and those that, that know about how these things work. I jumped these questions, just let me know, let, let me tell you that uh, we are indeed working on preparing a consultation. Uh, I can't tell you now uh, what the title of it will be, whether it will be Science 2.0 or ODS or some other word, but there will be one. Our commissioner very much wants it. Uh, we are working together, DG Connect and DG Research, on it. It's a pity that the colleagues that were announced to speak uh, to, uh, this morning uh, couldn't come in the end. Uh, because it would be important to really show also you know, the world that uh, the Commission is really uh, working together on this with one voice to drive this important uh, topic forward, and I'm very optimistic uh, for the future there. And then, you know, if you find it online, you have many pointers. With that, I thank you again for your patience. I know I spoke a bit long, but my watch is broken, so maybe I'm uh, excused. And I wish you a very interesting two days. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Maybe there are um, um, questions to Mr. Boer. We, I would think we have time for one or two questions. Otherwise, you will be staying for the next two days with us or leaving tonight? The whole time in the room, but he will be here, so, okay. Yes. How does she know all those insights that are how does she know indeed all those insights uh, that are not really aware to or, or most of the scientific community itself? So what kind of background research are you doing uh, to, to create this kind of uh, program and uh, forecast? Which is very convincing to me, actually. Well, I have a number of colleagues, a few hundred actually, not all of them are working on this, uh, but uh, they're smart people, they, they, they look at what happens around them, and so you have experts in this area who have followed this from some time. We had a 2009 already policy initiative called eScience at the time, so very much there's a focus on the digital, the impact of digital. Uh, today we see the whole thing in a bit broader ways, hence the open label for this, but it's really, uh, uh, there's a small set of principles that we try to apply across the whole uh, policy area of the digital agenda, openness being one of them, and here applying this really led to this treasure trove of ideas and positive things that, that uh, we, we could do, where we really feel that we could make a difference, and that's why our commissioner is quite motivated and, and enthusiastic about these things. And obviously, okay, you know how it works. Politicians have collaborators who try to prepare uh, stuff for them, and then they check it. If they're happy with the message, they sit down and record a message, and that's what, what happened here. And I'm very happy to hear that you find it convincing, because I find it also convincing. So.